A uh, very warm welcome to Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm Liz Price and um, I'm Head of School of Science and the Environment. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Simon Kapoor, who's going to speak with us this evening. Now, Simon has a BSc in Biology from York, a PhD in Plant Physiology from Sussex, and is now a professor in ecology and environment here at Manchester Metropolitan University. He has been at Manchester Met for 23 years, and we're very happy to have him. Since 1989, the focus of his research and teaching, which he absolutely loves, has been on the ecology of bogs and heathland plant communities, with particular interests in the impacts of air pollution, climate change, and the restoration of damaged peatland habitats. And I know that he's actually taught many of you in the room this evening. So it's lovely to see you here. So in relation to this overall interest, for example, he's run um, nitrogen manipulation experiments on heather moorland in Wales for over 25 years. And this was part of a research programme into acidification and eutrophication of terrestrial ecosystems. Now, within this programme, Simon led research into bioindicators of nitrogen eutrophication in varied UK habitats. I'm sure you will have read his work on that. Simon also leads climate change manipulation experiments on a raised bog in Wales, which examines the effects of warming, drought, and salt water on plant ecology and carbon to nutrient cycling. And um, he's going to tell us more about these things shortly. More recently, Simon has performed research on restoration of degraded, um, raised and lowland bogs with a focus on the recovery and restoration in particular of spatter moss, which uh, is your favourite thing. Now, Simon is happily married to Catherine, who we're delighted to have with us here, has three grown-up children, and outside of work, Simon sings in a church and acts in a local theatre, and he tells me... This often involves losing clothing in the best theatrical tradition, so you have been warned. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Simon, and I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting meeting. Thank you very much. So if you join me in welcoming Simon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a slight detour from the usual scientific presentation I make. Uh, as evidenced by this uh, opening slide. So I want you to think of a caption for this uh, lovely painting by Vallette, which is of, of uh, our university. Well, it's our university now. And we'll, look, we'll come back to this right at the very end. So uh, we're looking at dark materials, and by that I mean peat or PT materials. And, and here's just a, a list, well, just a emblems of uh, various organisations that we've worked with. And uh, I thank uh, those, I must say, I've forgotten RSPB on there. Um, uh, thanks for the, the help and, and uh, collaboration over the years. And there are a lot of colleagues uh, I'd like to, to thank as well, and they're mainly going to appear in various pictures. So a book that I gave my 94-year-old dad for his Christmas present was probably the, the, the favourite coffee table book of Christmas period, Tim Peake's uh, View of the Earth. And I looked at it and I saw this lovely picture that some of you will have, will have seen this sort of thing before. And I thought it's showing us there Tim Peake's view of dark materials or the, the dark spaces. Actually, he's highlighting the light, but I was thinking of the dark. And of the, above that is the aurora. Um, and I was thinking that I was trying to make the connection between this and I realised that the dark materials of peat and peaty soils tend to be found in those dark places on the map of the UK. And this one shows it a bit easier. That It shows more clearly the Peak District National Park here and the North Yorkshire Moors and the North Pennines and the Cumbria and the Southern Uplands and all this massive area of peat and peaty soils in, in northern Scotland and, and Wales and Bodmin and Dartmoor and Exmoor and so on. And these are areas that are really important to us. These are areas of the country that are relative wilderness 
There's a book here I really like called, by William Atkin called The Moor. And it says here, a journey into the English wilderness. And peatlands occupy in this country probably some of the best areas of what we might call wilderness. I know we don't live in a very wild country, but, but they, it, it, it can feel very wild if you're just 25 miles up on the top of the Peak District. And if you look at the national parks, the majority of them actually have a significant amount of peat within them. The New Forest does. The South Downs probably doesn't because it's on a limestone uh, ridge. Um, and perhaps the Pembrokeshire Coast, but all the others are significantly peaty. So in this country, as it says there, the peatlands form the largest expanse of semi-natural hab habitat, about 10% of UK land. They're very important to us. And on the world stage, peatlands form very massive areas, especially in the northern hemisphere. So what about beauty? I've called this science and beauty, and I was trying to blend some things together here. And if you go to Hull Moss, very rarely you can you actually see anything through this picture frame. And uh, you can see there that um, someone has put this up to give people a uh, perspective of beauty or of scenery whenever they go there. And the picture would change all the time, and the picture would change every day of the year where beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I've seen these elsewhere in the Pennines, and perhaps some of you know where else they are in the country. And I've, I came across some nice paintings in a, an art exhibit over Christmas, and I contacted the artist, Sarah Morley, and I said, can I show your painting? And she was very pleased. And this is Wildmoor, up on the upper Goit in, uh, in the Peak District, and it shows I assume that's a sort of autumnal colours coming through, and it's to me that's really beautiful and um, evocative. So, what are peatlands? Well, there's a range of peatlands, and uh, you start here with heather moorlands, which are on shallow peaty soils. This is Ruaben Moor, just into Wales, the other side of Wrexham, and it's overlooking to the Berwyn Mountains, and these sort of Heather moorlands or even the heather lowland heaths have really stimulated a lot of different authors, uh, the Brontes or Thomas Hardy. And I'm absolutely certain that the purple-headed mountain, the river running by from the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, um, was a, a product of uh, the scenery of heather moorland. If we go... Uh, onto a, a different sort of peatland habitat, we can find the upland blanket bog, which is a much deeper peat, so these could be several metres deep. In this case, we're, we're at um, a place called Moorhouse in the North Pennines, and this, these things here are experimental bits of equipment, I think probably for measuring carbon flux. And this is a, really quite a nice contrast to the Southern Pennines, that many of us would be familiar with because it's, it's, a, it's a much more intact peatland system, more species rich, and it's a more lonely place. Actually, this is W.H. Uh, Auden, the poet, wrote about, was, uh, wrote about the North Pennines, um, particularly the industrial archaeology side. Perhaps the, the jewel in the crown of the British peatlands are the, in the flow country. And this fantastic picture of... Um, from the RSPB, um, shows us off really beautifully. And it's uh, England's, la uh, sorry, <laughs> Britain's uh, <laughs> largest oh, carbon reserve, and it's a really unique wildlife, wildlife reserve. And a good colleague and friend of uh, many of us here, Richard Lindsay, produced a picture that presumably has come from the, almost the same environment. Uh, from the flow country of Caithness and Sutherland. And Richard Lindsay is, a, is an amazing fellow. He's, a, he's perhaps our number one peatland specialist in the country as a scientist, and he's also a pretty good artist and writer and poet. And it's very interesting how people have sometimes managed to merge these different things. Lowland raised bog in, this is Borth bog or Kors Fochno, 
in Wales. Um, and it's this bog here is this bit here, um, very close to the coast, perhaps at risk from sea level rise. And this is a, a lowland raised bog. Lowland bogs have arisen out of uh, water, uh, things like meres, small lakes, small valleys, and have grown up so they're raised above the surrounding landscape. If we come much closer to home, we've got a lot of bogs here. Unfortunately, most of them are not in a very good condition, and a lot of the, the Mersey Basin bogs have, have been dug or have been built on, or degraded in various ways, drained particularly, or drained in all cases if they've been used. So here we have uh, some that have now nature reserves and being looked after. Um, Holcroft Moss, uh, one I've got to know only fairly recently, a really nice intact moss uh, run by the Cheshire Wildlife Trust and Phil Brighton. Um, uh, red moss near, near Bolton, little Walden moss that's being uh, restored lovingly by the Lancashire Wildlife Trust. And a bit further out into Cheshire, we have all the mears and mosses. We have here uh, a student trip to the Delamere mosses. Or they, as they call it, the lost mosses of Delamere that they're trying to recover. Of course, particularly near these urban centres, these bogs were in the past often seen as waste, uh, useless places. So Daniel Defoe, I think it was after he wrote Robinson Crusoe, said, we passed the great bog or waste called Chat Moss. The surface looked black and dirty. What nature meant by such a useless production? It is hard to imagine. But the land is entirely waste, except for very poor cottages, fueled and the quantity used is very small. So this is a battle that we're facing with peatlands, not just uh, two or three hundred years ago, but, but still now. How to protect these really valuable habitats. How to convince people to protect them. So what sort of life, and I'm going to stick with the plants because that's where I feel at home, what sort of life do we have on bogs and moorlands? We have very interesting plants, very different sorts of vegetation that's adapted to very difficult conditions, very acidic soils, very nutrient-poor soils, often waterlogged, and usually exposed to pretty bad weather. And... I must say that if you go to almost all the bogs I've ever been on, wet or dryish or um, even degraded, heather, Coluna vulgaris, is, is somewhere to be found there. I'm sure Penny could disagree, but I think that's just about the case. Um, and the different ericaceous shrubs that are found on the moorlands and the bogs can tell us very much about the conditions there. So we go from dry we'd have bell heather, and if we go to wet, we find more cross-leaved heath. Still in the, in the Erica family, if we, if we go to the north, we're going to find more cowberry. If we go really far north, we find bearberry. But down in the south is the only sort of place you're going to find dorset heath. So they could be very good indicators of, of climate. And there's a whole range of really interesting and beautiful and, and very characteristic bogland plants and, and peatland plants. Now, down in the mossy layer, I thought I'd take some inspiration from Heckel in 1904, produced this lovely book called Art Forms in Nature, which I actually found in the library today. You would have thought they would have thrown it away. But uh, no, they hadn't. It's, so it's in the art section, actually. And uh, Haeckel was a very important ecologist, as much as uh, an, an artist, well, more so than an artist, I would say. And so this brings me to one of those mosses, the, the most important keystone species of, of the bogs, more, rather more than the moors, and that is the sphagnum moss. And so we have our first exhibit here. Um, the long stem of sphagnum moss that goes on and on and on until it stops growing 
uh, well, it grows from the top, but the down here, this is the piece is left behind to de degrade, but it doesn't decompose very much, which is why you get layers of peat building up. And uh, there's a wide variety of these, and you, you could see some of the specimens outside. And I thought I'd call Sphagnum Moss Bog the Builder. Um, I think some of these, these pictures are Chris Fields. Chris, this, I think this is your very good picture, this one. Um, and Sphagnum is, is quite commonly called the Bog Builder because it's the plant that holds onto water because of these hyaline cells, whether, which are effectively dead uh, physiologically, but they actually hold a lot of water. They also hold quite a lot of microbial and invertebrate life. And the whole thing grows upwards and upwards and, and forms, can form large hummocks. And if we think of the preservative properties of sphagnum, or well, why doesn't sphagnum decompose fully? Why does it, it live on for thousands of years? In, in partially decomposed state. And it's sort of connected to this property of um, being an antibiotic treatment or antiseptic treatment. And uh, I was looking through some interesting articles this week. There's a little bit of poetry here. The doctors and nurses look north with eager eyes and call on us to send them the dressing that they prize. Love, de dum de dum de dum de dum They kindly swag them moss. And... Apparently, I, I, it was quite new to me. I'd heard of sphagnum bandages and so on, but the, the volume of sphagnum that was used in the First War that came from North America or from Scotland or Ireland to make dressings was just enormous, millions of bandages. And this antiseptic property or this antimicrobial property, the ability to, to um, withstand decomposition and, and not degrade is very important in how sphagnum and peat uh, appear. So, for example, the body of Lindo Man, uh, just south of Manchester in Lindo Bog, uh, was found in, in the 1980s and by peat cutters, and, and it had been there for some few thousand years. And there is a long history of bog bodies that have turned up all over uh, northern Europe, and I'm sure they're all all over the peatlands of the world, yet to be found. And of course, this preservative property of, of peat um, is the reason why Jonathan Lajard might go out to peat bogs like on Little Walden Moss here and discover, well, he hasn't discovered them, but the, the diggers of the peat have discovered <coughs> these large fossil trees which have been preserved for thousands of years in the peat up until this point where they're starting to decompose. And Seamus Heaney wrote uh, poetry about the peatlands and about, uh, in a poem, famous poem called Boglands, about uh, material, for example, butter sunk under more than 100 years was recovered salty and white. The ground itself is kind black butter. So these properties of, of basically not breaking down, not decomposing, are the real reason why we have such large amounts of carbon stored in deep peat bogs. And peatlands store a really large proportion of the world's carbon on land. And you could say they slow global warming. Well, one way, another way of putting it, if they were released, if all the carbon in wetlands, peat wetlands was released, Apparently, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere would approximately double. So there's enormous carbon stores, which makes it really important to preserve, not just for their beauty, but for this global warming um, aspect. So just 3% of the global land area contains about 30% of the global soil carbon. Peatlands capture our rain and cloud water in, in good condition. The peatlands regulate the quality and the flow of our waters. 
And these things, the carbon store, the water store, the biodiversity, are probably the three most important things that you can easily recognise and as, as being what we now tend to call ecosystem services or natural capital, another term that's being used. But there are plenty of other things, educational and research um, activities, uh, inspiration or psychological mental health. This is meant to uh, uh, conjure up. Uh, other products, which I won't go into, honey and plenty of paintings have been done of heathlands and moorlands and bogs. But there are lots of threats, and I've just briefly run through these. Some of them are, are what I've called here difficult ones. They're ones that we, we have difficulty personally to do much about, or collectively we may be able to, but personally the threats of climate change and extreme weather, uh, drought and warming, potentially increased fire or sea level rise, long-range pollution, uh, pests and pathogens, so pests like heather beetle, um, can occur at, uh, without warning, without, it's quite difficult to predict when they're going to happen, but they have quite a, a, a big impact on the heather populations when they do. And then another group that I've actually called not so difficult. Now that's probably <laughs> quite contrary to some of your experiences about it's not, I'm saying they're not so difficult to, but they can, it can, what I mean is that it's not so difficult for people to actually make decisions about peat extraction or about agricultural improvement or about drainage or about overgrazing or development on land or wind farms or tracks, transport, building, local pollution. So these things are in, within our power, we hope, to, to do something about it. And these ones down here, just a little more difficult, or perhaps a lot more difficult. So I'm going to look uh, briefly at, at one of the things that we've been doing, on, which is looking at climate change on carbon exchange of bogs. And we've been doing this on the Borth bog. And we had some money from NERC and the EU um, to set up an experiment on, on, called Peat Bog on the Borth bog. Very lucky, generous, the owners of the bog were. The Natural Resources Wales, that is. So they let us build these chambers uh, at which these plastic piling goes down about a metre and a half uh, to control movement of water in and out of this enclosure here. And we have little roofs on some of them which give a warming to the air and the soil in that. So we were trying to do two things, look at the effect of of warming and of, of seasonal drought, summertime droughts, rather short, sharp drought periods, and see how this would affect um, the, the plants, the, the community, microorganisms, and the fluxes of, of greenhouse gases. Here's Martin, who's been doing his PhD on it here recently, and here's Anna, another PhD student. And here's me doing some work. Um, so what we were concerned with was the, the carbon balance, or one aspect of this was the carbon balance. And we can see here the flux of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis coming into the bog and the respiration of carbon dioxide by the soils and the plants and the animals and everything that lives uh, coming out. And we also see a, a methane flux. But the main fluxes on this bog of, of carbon are CO2. And these things are roughly in balance. There's respiration and photosynthesis are roughly, on a global scale, over land at least, are roughly the same, which is very fortunate, until you get disturbance of, of systems. So photosynthesis could be reduced or respiration could be increased by changes, by damaging changes to these bogs. And we were looking at the effect of temperature and, and drought on these. These are a couple of postdocs, James and Richard, who were running this project. And one thing we did was to drought these plots. We actually pumped water out. It was quite uh, amazing. We didn't know if it would actually work, but it seemed to. And 
Martin, uh, I saw a little bit of data here from last year. Martin was doing measurements of, of gas fluxes, as we call them, gas flows out and into the bog. And 2014 data, he recently sent me. And what I, I've tried to symbolize with these arrows are, so this means that the bog is absorbing CO2, and this one here means the bog is releasing CO2. And the normal condition over this summer period of a, a couple of months was that the, the control situation was to absorb CO2 in photosynthesis more than releasing in respiration. But warming the bog increased the respiration, so we get less net uh, uptake. Drought reduced that further, sorry, in increased the respiration as well in the aerobic top layer, but also reduced photosynthesis, because these plants here look very dry. Warming and drought took us in the opposite direction. So the bog was then more, more likely to be releasing carbon dioxide than taking it up, which is not the history of good bogs, which is not what we want. So this idea of studying um, gases moving from um, bogs into the atmosphere and, and this sort of experiment, I think, can at least give us some clues as to how the, the system works and what might happen with climate change. Now, I was in the uh, Manchester Town Hall for the Chancellor's, Peter Mandelson's, uh, crowning uh, a few uh, months ago, and I came across this picture, one of the Manchester murals by Ford Maddox Brown, Maddox Brown, and I was just, I was actually really pleasantly surprised. Um, and this is a picture of John Dalton collecting marsh gas, which is, which is methane, in about 1800, when he was researching atomic theory. And John Dalton is the name of this building because he was a Manchester scientist. Our university wasn't here at that time, but uh, he was working in an area close to, to where it, we, we've ended up. And so he, what he was doing here, I think, was, was stimulating the sediments in the bottom of this pond. And then this uh, young scholar was collecting marsh gas in a jam jar and taking it home. And, and then John Dalton probably spent several weeks analysing uh, methane. And nowadays, we have a very heavy instrument to do this instantly. But unfortunately, as my students will attest, if you put it on that plank, uh, it would certainly bend it and uh, probably break it. But it's a, very, it's a very nice painting, and I, I really appreciate the scientific content here. So let's look at some other threats and problems. Many damage, peatlands in damage, are damaged, badly damaged in Britain. And the situation in the lowlands is somewhat different from the uplands, because the lowlands are largely deliberately damaged. They're deliberately cut. Whereas in the uplands, some damages are deliberate, but largely it's, it's a side effect of doing other things. So a lovely painting by Turner I came across of a peat bog in Scotland, and I, I thought, well, these guys look like they're peat cutters. And um, this is a, a, lovely old, a lovely picture of a sort of domestic peat cutting scene, isn't it? And, and here's a picture of me standing in front of some Irish uh, peat on the round stone bog. And in fact, on the way out there, I went to a shop, Tesco's, and bought one of these, these little uh, cubes, these little logs of peat. So in Ireland, it's still used as a domestic uh, fuel. It's actually, it's called a fire log. It doesn't say anywhere on this packaging that it contains peat. <laughs> um, but uh, and this is obviously a historical use of peat. And it's, a, it's probably in those areas of the world where a relatively small amount is being used, it might actually be a sort of sustainable practice. And in, if you go to many parts of the world, there's still an awful lot of peat being used in this way, but also be used in, in much larger ways. And if you just go around the northwest, you can see um, peat still being cut, or this one's Bolton Fell Moss up near the Scottish borders is recently bought by Naturaline, and so it's, it's not. There's still some peat cutting on the edges of the Manchester Mosslands and on 
Lindo Moss in, uh, near Wilmslow. Cut for horticulture. And you can see this easily from the air. If you go to Bolton Fell Moss in the border country, you can see these tram lines of how it's being cut. And a really nice comparison, a little bit south of that, is the intact peat dome of Walton Moss. But if you go to somewhere like Canada or, the, or in Scandinavia, some areas of Scandinavia, peat cutting is done on a massive scale. And, and uh, it says here, it is available, and boy, is it available. Uh, it's renewable. After harvesting a bog for a few years, the bog is restored and sphagnum starts to grow again. Be a period in between where it's just drying out and desiccating and, and uh, oxidizing and a lot of carbon going up into the air and the, the, the biodiversity of the habitat would be quite severely damaged. So whether it's complete able to reverse and, and regrow and restore itself is quite questionable, I think. So let's look at, uh, at some of the problems on the UK blanket bogs. The sort of damage we can see there, such as in the Peak District. Um, uh, that's uh, coming from a, a Blake's uh, poetry in Jerusalem. I just figure dark satanic mills could mean somewhere like... Uh, in Glossop, or further over here into Manchester. So we're up, the, up halfway up the Snake Pass, I think at Cabin Clough or somewhere like that, um, onto Blanket Bog, which looks more like Heather Moorland. And the sort of damage that many of you know, you work up there and you, you can see up there, it's not, net, it's not always eroded peat like this. Sometimes it's areas that are just monoculture of... of purple moor grass or, or cotton grass, rather boring. Um, up here on the top of uh, Bleaklow, um, in some uh, peatier areas there where the surface is completely degraded, and gullied here it's on Bleaklow as well. And here we have, oh, it's Kate here with her dog. <laughs> um, and here we have a sort of slightly in between, it's not quite as bad as this, but this is a very degraded surface, which I know they've been trying to restore very well. And there's quite a, a story that's grown up over the years, and I'm sure it's more or less right, that these areas in, were impacted by air pollution for, for quite a long period since the Industrial Revolution. This picture by Vallette, who, who worked in this university, well, in the School of Art preceding the university, shows this the sort of... Uh, gives the impression of the pollution of the smog of the day. This is, you can see the assurance building being built there, actually, at the time. And uh, Angus Smith, who worked in Manchester, also could see there was no hope for vegetation in a climate such as we have in the northern parts of the country. And if we go into the Peak District and, and take, take a peak core, as Jonathan Lajard here demonstrating to some of our students, you can see this increase in lead into the surface soils and then a drop-off as we come into the very modern period post uh, the lead in taken out of uh, fuels. We don't exactly know the dating, but we can sort of guess this is in the increased during the industrial, the post-industrial revolution period. But there's quite a, a lot of evidence, quite a lot of anecdotal evidence, a little bit of documented <coughs> evidence of, of, an, of recovery of vegetation in recent decades, exactly when it's difficult to say, but we looked at it about 10 years ago. We had some money for more still in the future to revisit some sites that were surveyed by Professor John Lee here in, well, his, his student, Colin Studholm, in uh, around about 1980 or the early 80s. And we, he could <coughs> hardly find any sphagnum. He was actually trying to do some experiments and he, he couldn't find enough to work on. Um, 
And we went back to these sites, and, and we also looked at some transplants that they'd put in about 35 years before. Well, actually, about 1980 it was. And... Many of these have actually grown on really well. And uh, when we found this about in, in about 2005, it, it, gave, it gave great support, really, to the idea that it was worth restoring, trying to in, reintroduce sphagnum. That would, it could, there was a good chance that it was going to take off. Uh, and that perhaps the, the pollution problems of the, the period up to perhaps around about 1990 uh, had, had, had dropped away. And uh, I'm glad Penny is here because she and I have had little sort of conversations about plants we've seen up at Holm Moss in the last few years. I haven't seen this one, but Penny's found royal fern, and we've seen stag's horn club moss, we've seen fir club moss, and these are, are really good findings. They, they may well have been there uh, many, many decades ago, but they have not been seen for a long time. And this is probably associated with the rise, the improvement in the rain pH was a marker of acidity in the rain, and the improvement in the soil pH. Maybe a lot of improvements in other aspects of pollution as well. But how far will this recovery go? And I've put here from the film Zootopia, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room which is a rather nice scene if you want to catch it on YouTube. Uh, or rather, the cow. And so I say the cow because the cow and farming are the main causes of atmospheric nitrogen pollution in, in, in the UK region. And nitrogen pollution harms people, and it, uh, and it harms plants. Sorry. It harms vegetation, plant communities, the sort of balance of of species in plant communities. And maybe the people working in this area could see uh, a way of trying to get people's interest in this by reminding them that this is probably affecting their, their health as well as their, the vegetation. So we looked into this and uh, it, <coughs> over the last 25 or something years and, and uh, Chris Field did his PhD on this work. Chris, where's Chris? Oh, he's up there, right. Um, I'm showing off to Joan Daniels, who got an MBE for her work on the restoration of Fens, Wixall, Bettersfield mosses. Showing off uh, data or mapping of, of, of uh, pollution levels and the high ones over the Shropshire, Cheshire area of ammonia from farming is quite a problem for Joan because this is the area where her bog is. Well, why is it a problem? It's because we, we believe that nitrogen is a problem uh, called eutrophication. It produces too much, too much fertilizer effect, really, on, um, on a range of plant communities. Here's a picture of Jackie Carroll and myself, and we, we worked on this site for many years. I started this experiment in 1989, and, and Chris Field has taken on maintaining this experiment recently actually about 10 years ago. Um, and here's some pictures from that. There's Chris here. <coughs> Myself in 89, you can see the sort of clothing we used to wear in those days. <laughs> um, and the very high quality e e equipment. Here's, here's Mike Pilkington doing some really good quadrating. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, my son here was in a gas chamber. <laughs> that, uh, that Chris had constructed to look at carbon fluxes from the, between the soil and the, uh, and the air. And there's Chris's dog, who's the, uh, the departmental field ecology dog. So we did a lot of experiments, and, his, and Mike did, Mike produced five PhDs from this uh, project. Of, sorry, five, <laughs> five journal papers out of his PhD. Only Mike caught that one. Um, and, and, and then we went on and we looked at regional surveys across the country with other groups to see whether this effect of, of nitrogen on biodiversity um, sort of spelt out when you actually look across the whole landscape, when you look across the whole country.
country, when you look at gradients of nitrogen pollution from farming, from vehicle combustion, from power stations, and so on. And up here we can see an increase in species richness in habitats collected using quadrat data. And along here we have nitrogen deposition uh, measured or modeled. And a similar sort of response in a range of different habitats. And this work has actually been really quite, well, quite valuable, quite uh, what we call in university terms quite impact or impactful, if you can excuse the sort of university jargon. Um, and it has a lot of public interest, and we've, we've produced lots of reports. I, I had to go down to do some filming for BBC on this uh, the other year. And Chris and I have produced um, a lot of publications and reports which have been, uh, are on their way to really having an influence on the nitrogen uh, policy in the country. Okay, I had a, a missing uh, caption here. I just wonder if anyone's got any idea what this might be. An overview of the progress and challenges of in Western Europe. What do you think? Anyone got a nice, funny, uh, ca missing caption? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I thought it could be Boris Johnson uh, and um, Michael Gove or something like that. Um, it's actually Peatland Restoration. And in fact, it's a paper title that Penny and I were on quite recently in the guest publication Restoration Ecology. So I just want to turn now to, to restoration, the theme of restoration and recovery of these peatlands. So we've looked at uh, the how lovely these places are. We've looked at some problems, and now I'm going to turn to how we're attempting to improve them. Okay, well, restoration is uh, the word we tend to use, but really we're probably talking about repair. Restoring something to its original self may be quite hard. As someone in the... Um, UNEP said, restoration of peelands is a low-hanging fruit. It's dead easy, I suppose he's saying, and among the most cost-effective options for mitigating climate change. So it's a really good reason for doing it because of the carbon stores, even if you're not interested in the other ecosystem services. However, certainly in here in Western Europe, there's been a, well, perhaps the major... I'm, Absolutely certain the major funder for uh, peatland restoration has been the EU LIFE program. And the prospects of continuing that are obviously not good. And where, whether the funding will be taken up by uh, the government is a, is a question. But in terms of the ecology, what we're looking at really is can we go from this on Little Walden Moss to this sort of habitat on both bog. So here we have a low species, biodiversity poor, fairly dried out um, place that's emitting carbon. It's res respiring carbon. There's no, there's no chance of any carbon going in there. Here we have a photosynthesizing growing bog that's wet, that's really species rich, really interesting, lovely, joyful habitat. And I'm going to mention a lot uh, Moors for the Future, because they've done most of the work in the, in the area of the Pennines that I know. And, um, and we've worked some of our time with them. And I'm sure they'd agree, peat bog restoration requires serious intervention. Uh, it's not about just planting a few bits of sphagnum or something like that. It's really major hydraulics putting in uh, piling a, a large massive efforts in, in controlling water to try and reduce the, the speedy runoff of water from the plateaus. This is on Kinder in a lovely wet day <coughs> on an MSC field trip. And here's a picture from the Moors of the Fu Future, just trying to give the impression of this big effort in restoring on a landscape scale, um, trying to stabilize the surface of, of, of bare eroded peats 
by putting down lime and fertilizer and grass seed and heather brash. And so we got in, involved in this. And oh, this was a, a picture that won a, a second prize. I, you know, why it won second, I just don't know. But it was one of my pictures I took at Holmos Science Meets the Eye competition about um, 10 years ago. And it's funny, you can only just see the, the radio mast there. I remember being there on the day, and I couldn't see the radio mast. I could only see it when I saw the photo later. And this, I took a group of foundation students up, and we, uh, were, they, we, we were getting them to uh, help spread brash in the, in the winter. And what we did there was we tested the standard treatment that the Moors Future had, which is lime and fertilizer, grass seed, and heather brash, not necessarily in that order. And uh, Dr. Robin Sen over here was out there. This is what s academics do in the summer, um, using his lawn, lawn applicator. Um, here we have Professor Nancy Dice putting in bamboo canes, uh, myself, and we're project students. And we set up a really big experiment with 40 different plots, three by uh, three meters, to look at whether we were asked by the Moors of the Future to say, do we actually need to use high levels of lime and fertilizer? Because um, that's quite a serious application to systems that are naturally acidic and naturally low nutrient. And I'm pretty convinced that we found uh, that, yes, we did need to. And this is 10 years on, it's a recent picture. It's where nothing is added, you've, there's nothing growing there. Where we added lime uh, fertilizer, just one of lime and fertilizer, not repeated, and also grass seed and heather brash, there's at least a, a, a reasonable cover of vegetation. I think because it's a very isolated plot, it has a big edge effect, so it's not very representative of what would happen. The important point to me was that we got um, Empetrum nigrum, we've got um, that is crowberry, and we've got a hare's tail cotton grass growing up there. And these were not plants that were seeded there. They've come in. They haven't come in here, but typically on these, these uh, fertilizer line plots, they've come in because of the, a sort of facilitation. They've been helped by the original planting of the grass seed and the, and the brush. And there's a picture here of Steve Maynard. <laughs> doing his experiments and, and some pictures where I, I'm actually not sure where they've come from. I knew where I found them, but I couldn't be sure who the author was. Um, so this was on Black Hill a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, where there was just a sea of black, dark peat eroding, enormous rate of erosion, of loss of peat and uh, dark brown water and, and all this, all this sort of tendon problems. And this is more recent. And, and what Steve's been finding in his master's project he's doing with us uh, while he's working at Morse of Future is, is that the sort of different, su subtle differences in the treatments of restoration, whether you use brash or whether you use lime and seed and fertilizer, um, have produced different, at the moment, different endpoints in the sort of plant community that's ended up there. Um, so you have one target is to restore and stabilize the ground with grass seed and heather. But actually, a bit later down the road, you can see a lot of other bryophytes and things coming in, and high, other higher plants, that you didn't expect to see. Um, and actually, the problem for Steve in his writing up this project is that it's hard to explain where they've come from. <laughs> we, just, we don't know where these plants have come from, but, but they've been facilitated by their neighbors. Um, a little bit of work below ground. So what's happening below ground? And there's some pictures that Robin Sen has given me to show. We know a lot about the plants and the soil that they're sitting in in terms of some physical properties. We know loads about birds and quite a bit about um, small animals. We know much less about these things in the middle. And particularly, uh, Robin's area of interest, the fungi and the bacteria and the archaea uh, the more primitive bacteria, perhaps. And so Robin's been spending perhaps about the last 10 years 
trying to get to grips with this. And here he is with his typical hat. This is winter dress. Um, and here's a little tube. The good thing about soil microbiology is they don't need to take very much material away with them. And they just hammer this little into the thing into the surface soils. And what Robin and his team, uh, David, Eli Eli David Elliott and, and Felix, um, did a few years ago was they took some transects across the area, just to the north of Holmost, the radiomast area. They were, what they wanted to do was to look at this mosaic of different surfaces, of bare soils, of soils with 25-year-old um, uh, restoration that, in fact, Penny Anderson and company had, had put in, and also other areas that had just been recently re restored. And other areas were, were probably something close to the original vegetation. And the result is actually really quite complicated for someone like me. It doesn't, doesn't know a lot about microbiology, but I think I can just about uh, blag this one. So on the bare peats, you've got rather low culturable uh, bacteria. Here we are over here. Where we have treated, that is recently treated, say, two years ago, got an increased population. So this is counts of bacteria. Where they were about 25 years ago, we got it even better, and it's up to the, about the same level as the, the original undamaged um, uh, land. But as Robin always says, when you plate out cultures of, of microbes on, on agar plates, you don't get the full picture because there's a very, very large proportion, something like, is it 80 or 90 percent, don't, don't grow in culture. And so, he and his colleagues were using, going further than that, they were using DNA sequencing to, um, to try and look at the whole population. And Robin, more recently, been describing what he calls the microbiome. That is all the different microbial, fungal, bacterial, archaeal um, species and the, and the population and the, and the apparent interactions that go on between them uh, from looking at the, the DNA patterns. And these are very complicated figures that, uh, that try and describe a bit of this community chain. So if you look down here in the bacteria, the, the bare peat is down here. And this is a way of, this, or, this um, ordination plot is a way of describing how close samples <coughs> are to each other and how, how separate they are from, from other samples. So the bare peat samples all come in around here. The original vegetation come in this green line here. Penny's 25-year-old plots come in over here. And the two-year plots of uh, different types are around about here. So the two years are similar in their sort of community structure to the, the bare peats, but they're moving away. And, and some years later, we get this population or this, this community, shall we, that is well over here and maybe isn't going to go back to the original because it's a different plant community. This is a very heather-dominated system and this is more um, grass and sedge and, and bilberry. And something similar happening in the fungi. So what I take from this is that the, the above-ground restoration is kick-starting the below-ground microbial populations and, and their functions. And it may not be going back in the same direction to the original, but it's going off. And it's, maybe it's a diagnosis that, that there's an improvement or a big change going on. So lastly, just thought uh, we'd have a little quiz here. Who's the odd one out? So this is our vice chancellor. He's certainly not odd one out. Um, this is Seamus Heaney, the Nobel <laughs> Laureate in poetry. This is Caroline Duffy, our poet laureate here. And here we have a bag of sphagnum beads. Does anybody know the odd one out? That in my mind? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I just thought I'd say Seamus Heaney's written a lot about peat based on sphagnum. 
Malcolm Press did his PhD on sphagnum um, and the impacts of pollution in, in, at Holm Moss. Here we have some sphagnum. So it's Caroline Duffy, who I don't think has done anything about sphagnum. <laughs> but, you know, there's always a chance. So how do we restore sphagnum? Um, so we've been doing a little bit of work here. And this is a picture of Bolton Fell Moss, this heavily eroded site in Cumbria, before it was taken over by natural England, actually. The sphagnum, the problem, particularly down this part of the country, this area, is there's little available locally. There's a large demand to, to recover places like this. It's not, maybe not ethical or safe to transport large amounts from across the different parts of the country where there's a lot, say in Scotland, to the, the South Pennines. And a lot, of, quite a lot of sphagnum is in conservation areas anyway, particularly in England. Um, and you may not want to move uh, and import genotypes from one area to another. So there are there are all sorts of problems, potentially. I can see the RSPV smiling on there. I'll save you the question. So we've been working with this company, Micropropagation Services, to try and get around some of those problems and, and start with very small amounts of material here, which is cultured in, in, um, in tissue culture methods in, in, uh, in the lab and produce these sphagnum beads, which then typically, in the lab at least, they grow up very well, almost complete 100% uh, take and growth into material that, that actually, in, when planted out, can look like that. So we, we tested these things out. Angus Rosenberg was a PhD student who had this task, quite a difficult task, of testing these methods of propagating, uh, well, taking the propagated material and putting it out onto the land to see if it could be used to, to do sphagnum recovery. A lot of the work was, was funded by partners like uh, Moors of Future and, and the RSPB uh, and various other people in the, in the Peak District. And I've just got a, a couple of summary slides, really. I mean, we, we actually had a lot of problems with this. And we found pretty poor survival on things like dried peat mounds. So we put the, the beads out on these sort of mounds, even when there was quite good vegetation. Um, <coughs> certainly problems on mobile peat. Um, this area here is too dry. Uh, or in or in thick vegetation here, like beads that have gone into millennia uh, purple moorgrass. Uh, and here's Steph planting her MSC experiment up here. But we did have some good stories. They tended to be the minority story, but we did find it, it, was, it has taken well, the, these beads, in areas where there was good support from things like cotton grass. Here, here's an area of cut millennia up on the Marsden Moor estate. Or where there's, there's regularly wet peat pans, like here, and some accompanying vegetation. And here is in a, a water, high water table area up near Holmos. And this, in fact, was a recent picture taken of, of beads that were planted in 2009. So we have had some success. and and. Neil and his company, Micropropagation, have, have gained, I hope, a little bit from, from our assistance. Uh, he, he, Neil told me recently they've got um, about 140 hectares will have been planted by March this year in the Peak District in Yorkshire. And they've just tendered for 1.2 million sphagnum plugs uh, for uh, next period. And these are the to sort of development on from those beads was actually to grow these on into, into plugs that are can be put into the ground. And these are called beader hummock now. Um, lastly, in the lowlands, we've done some work with these sphagnum introductions. And it's grown typically much better because of the climate, I think. 
And Anna here um, just started, uh, just moved on to a PhD work with us, is looking at whether these propagated sphagnum, the micropropagated sphagnum put into these lowland sites, behave, if they physiologically behave like the normal bog standard bog moss. So do they do the normal things? Meaning, do they grow? Well, we know they grow, but how do they do in terms of controlling the carbon balance? And so we have this apparatus here, this uh, methane and CO2 analyzer to look at these fluxes of, of these gases on and off uh, under different conditions. And one of the sort of simple findings so far is that when you measure the methane coming off bare peat, there's practically zero in, in these systems. Where you've got planted, well, it, it's naturally come in the cotton grass with or without some sphagnum in it, there's a very large flux of methane. And we want to work with this system and try to understand more about the difference, these two species, these, the sphagnum needs the cotton grass to grow up and be planted around and be sheltered. And we're hoping to also do some molecular microbiology work um, on, the, on the sphagnum as it's planted out. <coughs> and the future, in Germany, they see a future for wetland farming actually using sphagnum in an agricultural type setting to, to, to produce um, a, a, a sphagnum crop. And there's examples out, outside, actually, but this would be a sphagnum crop that could be dried and mixed with uh, another green composting fiber. And there's quite a good potential. It's been tested out in Germany on quite a big scale. Uh, and, and that's got a quite a nice use, uh, economic use, for farmers in wetland areas where, where uh, it's, con it's suitable. Um, lastly, we had a, my brother-in-law actually is a poet, and uh, he wrote a poem for, for the Manchester Science Festival that we used, and you can actually hear, so hear it, you can download it outside, if you use one of these cards that you can pick up, and you can use a QR code to, um, to hear it. His poem is actually 14 minutes long, so I wasn't going to... Um, give that to you now, but I'd, I thought I'd like to finish with this, the last part of the poem. So this is about the eyes of um, look, thinking of it as Lindo Man uh, about to be sacrificed on uh, and dipped, uh, pushed into the bog for some reason. Of that dank water, of acidity high, that edge where earth cries out for sky, what did his blood-dimmed eyes last see? He would face them forwards, not bowed, but upright. I am a warrior. So just to conclude, peatlands are great places. They give us lots of things. They're under threat and they need protection. We have the knowledge, I think we have the skills and we have the materials to look after the peatlands. So let's do it. Now, did anybody think of a caption for this one? Help there's nout in here. The what? There's nout in here. There's nout in here. <laughs> Horse smog get bog. Horse what? For smog get bog. Oh, for smog get bog. Yes. Yeah. Very good. I just thought, not again, dark materials for lunch. <laughs> or I thought Oxford Road was a green corridor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simon. We have some time for questions, but Simon made me promise not to have too many, because <laughs> I think he'd rather talk to you <laughs> outside. So... But please do ask questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. There's a five year translocation. Sorry, if you could, I know I know who you are, but if you could introduce yourself before you speak as well. <laughs>
And in, in the 35 year translocation, what was the reason for this Spikeman not surviving so well? Um, well, originally, it was, and it was being written in the paper that John Lee and his colleagues wrote, they originally had thought that it was pollution was the problem, because they, they, they only went back after about two years uh, and uh, said there was nothing, there's nothing here. Um, it could be that, it could well be that the, the, the blocks of peat from North, North Country they put in, they didn't, uh, they didn't really connect very well hydrologically, and so they dried out and managed to survive and, and then have managed to come back. Uh, don't know really exactly. Hello, uh, Kate Hanley. I work for the RSPB in Peak District. Um, so, in partnership with United Utilities, we have a four thousand hectare patch <coughs> and we're really heavily involved in uh, lawn restoration. Um, I'd just like to make a brief case for translocating natural spikenard um, as part of the suite of restoration works. Um, so, that picture you showed with the thirty-five year patch of spikenard that has been transplanted, it was maybe a metre long, that sort of thing. Yeah. So we're seeing that sort of growth after five years with our naturally translocated sphagnum. Um, I think you put up a slide saying that there were questions over whether it was ethical and um, safe. Safe, I think, too. I'm thinking of <coughs> pests or things that yeah, might be Yeah, so we have, um, we've been translocating natural sphagnum for at least five years now. Start the first trial six years ago. Um, we're doing it on quite a large scale, so we're doing around about 100 hectares of um, sphagnum inoculation a year on our ground. Um, we have agreed protocols from Natural England um, for those very reasons for transplanting sphagnum from um, further afield. We have agreed from, with Natural England, we have transplanted sphagnum from uh, Scottish borders, um, from South Wales, from Cumbria. Um, and from Boland, we also use sphagnum from our own site, from uh, flushes within our own site. So we have a biosecurity protocol and a biosecurity checklist that we use. Um, and we do quite a bit of monitoring to make sure we're not doing anything stupid. Um, and we're seeing excellent growth, really good growth. So within five years, we're seeing something that started off that size, as a handful, um, turn into a metre square plus. Um, so this is part of the work that James has been doing, that you've been kindly helping him with, Simon. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a case for doing natural translocation, and the other thing is um, we approved through work that we've done uh, with one of our sister sites um, in Cumbria and through our own site that it's an entirely sustainable thing to do. So we take 10% of what is in an area, um, and we can go back year on year. Um, it takes less than a year for it to recover, um, and we can harvest again. Um, so I know also that most of the future are doing um, a little bit of work on proving that harvesting hummus form is that way sustainable. Um, um, that's going to naturally and uh, it's turning out to be okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear. Good. Sorry, I just had to get off. Yeah, no, that's, thank you. that's good. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, Margaret Lippman from um, Lincoln Park. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the effects of, of um, setting fire to them? Uh, well, which, which sort of more are you talking uh, about? Well, sphagnum moss and heather moss. So sometimes it's, you know, they, they do it for, for uh, grouse shooting. Yeah. yeah. And for other reasons too. It's so so it's, it's on, done on an industrial <coughs> scale. Sometimes there's, there's, you know, blankets of, of smoke everywhere. And in the night time, you can see the fires burning. Yeah. What are the effects of Well, I, I mean, burning has long been used as a management on, on heather moorland. And it's quite favoured, not so much nowadays perhaps because it's it, uh, getting people to do it or it's to see, it seems to be easier to use cutting tools. But on, on, in terms of bogs, it's not advised. I think Natural England uh, uh, have got rules against it. Um, uh, and it can, it can damage the bog community, the bog plants and, and uh, animals. Invertebrates and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it, should, it shouldn't be done. Yeah, it just seems so so completely obvious. I, I just don't understand. Yeah. 
I am talking about bogs. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name's Rob Keane. I um, work for Natural England on a project uh, called Long Term Monitoring Network. We've got a network of 37 sites across a range of habitats where we do a whole lot of ecosystem monitoring. And it's come from the Environmental Change Network. So I know that, I'm going to know this very well because it'll be masses here. Um, so, uh, <coughs> touched on report, but we, we are now collecting data on the, some lowland bogs and uh, lowland raised bogs and hunter bogs across the network, and we're also collecting the DNA soil bacteria sampling as well, soil chemistry, and uh, pollution monitoring as well, in terms of dry and wet deposition. Um, so, and then we've, we've just released all the data from all the vegetation plots over the surveys across all the 37 sites over the last six or seven years. So, we are a stage getting to a point where we need to start thinking about how we're going to use the data. <laughs> yes. So, in terms of end deposition, effects on mm. communities. Um, and obviously, we do weather, measure, measure the weather as well, the weather stations in terms of climate change. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of us are trying to start to get involved with you in, in using that. I've got a third year project student who's, who's doing some data analysis. It's a great opportunity, isn't it? You're, you're generating loads of data, and yeah. actually, it doesn't got trying to do yeah. much with it. I mean, yeah. we've got lots of students who could. So we should talk more. I think we should have a proper meeting about that. If we've been discussing that in the past, haven't we? But we need to. Yeah. We will. Can I just ask a question about um, acid rain? You showed a very interesting graph showing the effects of nitrogen pollution on diversity, the number of habitats. But the acid rain story is over 200 years before that and has actually declined since. I've been very interested in seeing, you know, Moss's book, 1913, Vegetation of the Peak District. And it's got long lists of plants that would normally characteristically be associated with acid grasslands, for example. I was looking for Millennium at the conference we went to. Um, which were much, much longer than what you actually see in uh, many acid grasslands now. So I'm, and, and what we have talked about in terms of this, you know, and all the things you've been saying about the species coming back in the banking books now, leads me to wonder if we got any real information about what acid rain effects had on some of the acid grasslands around these bogs as well. The historical acid, acid, acid rain. Um, I, d I don't know. I mean, we tend to do do these things now by looking across the country and looking at spatial current <coughs> gradients and trying to sort of step back and think of them as being <coughs> historical gradients or a space for time substitute. Um, and you, don't, you can go to areas that are, that are really seem quite clean but actually receive quite a bit of, well, a, a sort of have received historically um, moderate levels of, of acid rain and nitrogen pollution. <coughs> And you can see quite significant uh, impacts on on things like species composition. So I think it's difficult to find ways of getting, going back in time to look at those, you know, to imagine what those systems were like, especially when they were managed in different ways on grasslands. What's the time of the next train? Just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Last night, just wondering, peat cutting. Um, there's been a lot of sort of concern about it and so on. I know people have licenses. And, you know, is it is it reducing? Is, is are we actually seeing the, the use of peat in horticulture and so on and, and burning it um, reducing, or is it still a major? <coughs> Well, in, in uh, Britain, peat cutting is, uh, on large scale, horticultural yeah. peat cutting is phasing out. I think by 19, uh, sorry, by 2020, it's, it's going to be uh, illegal to use uh, peat in domestic, uh, for domestic purposes, for, for, you know, horticultural peat that is, in, in Britain. And by 2030, I think it's going to be completely phased out. But, the problem with that is that we will probably then, unless we have 
depending on the border, border trade and so on, we'll import it from the Baltic or yeah. somewhere else. And so dig somebody else's hole. But it, it is, in, in Britain, it's, it's certainly much less than it was. Well, I hope you'll join Simon afterwards for um, a catch-up and have a look at some of the um, exhibits he set out for you. But I'd like to ask you now to join me. Thank you, Simon, very much for a really interesting